Okay, we're back. We're live. This is Think Tech. More specifically, this is History Lens. And we are so happy that John Davidan can join us today. Uh, he's professor of history at HPU. And today we're going to talk about Iran, which is so totally relevant. We're going to find out right. you know, what happened here with U.S. and Iran over the 20th century and into the 21st century. We need to right. know about this to understand the context of the confrontation that's going on right now. Hi, John. How right. are you? Jay, Jay, I'm good. Uh, first of all, I want to, uh, quite frankly, apologize to my listening audience. I took a hiatus here from History Lens, and, uh, and I'm back. So uh, we're going to do a couple of shows maybe on the Iran crisis, and then we're going to move on. We'll probably look at uh, the history of economic crises. And uh, so we sh should have some very interesting shows this spring. So. Yes, looking forward. Good. Yeah, good to see you, Jay. Uh, the same. So let's talk about Iran. Uh, Iran is, right. uh, at least last week, it was on everybody's minds. It's funny how the, the fickle finger of the media moves on, but we should still look back. We should still figure out where we are with Iran. So where have we been? How did it all start? The relationship between the U.S. and Iran has been very complex for a long time. Talk about it, will you? Yeah, so, right. So, you know, we're in the midst of this crisis with Iran, and it, it doesn't look like it's going to become a war, uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's very serious, actually. It could have easily become a war in the last couple of weeks. Um, there is an intense amount of distrust between these two nations, and that should actually, I mean, most Americans would assume, oh, this is normal. This is the way it should be, right? We don't trust the Iranians. Come on, they're these Islamic people. They're Middle Easterners. We just don't trust them. But the, the interesting thing is Iran is one of few democracies in the Middle East. I say it again, dem, uh, Iran is a democracy. It's also a theocracy. So it's got this kind of mixed form of government between the two. But uh, so uh, this is, it's, it's a very interesting place. Uh, Iran is a place that in the 1970s and the 1980s had a very active uh, middle class, well-educated, somewhat wealthy, uh, politically active. Uh, and uh, I mean, that's declined certainly since the Islamic revolution in 1979, but still you have this very outward looking uh, 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 people in Iran who, who are very interested in what's going on in the West. Um, I think there was a study a few years ago that said that Iran had more satellite dishes uh, than anywhere else in the Middle East. They're very engaged with, you know, the media of the West, the popular culture of the West. So when, so, when you talk to an, an Iranian um, who's, you know, come from Iran and been born and raised in Iran, um, he or she seems to be almost Western. They are, they, they sound like, act exactly. like, think like Western people. That's the remarkable exactly. thing. Here's a theocracy, which they may or may not agree with, but they are yeah. essentially Westerners, yeah? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I mean, this, is a, this is a country that modernized between World War II and, and 1979. And, and, uh, and you know, it's, so it's, a, like I say, it's a surprise that this, there's this level of tension between countries that actually should be uh, at least respectful to each other and maybe even partners. But uh, so then the question is, why is this the case? Why are these tensions there when they shouldn't be? And, and so we're going to go back into history and we're going we're gonna to find out why Iran and the United States, uh, why, these, why there's so such deep animosity between the government. So, yes. okay. So, so really, Jay, it boils down to one word. Guess what word that is? Let me make a wild guess, John. Oil. Oil. Yeah, Jay, you win the prize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so oil is exceedingly, it's an exceedingly important part of the economy of Iran. It constitutes maybe, uh, uh, maybe 80% of all of Iran's revenue. Uh, it was, it the oil production in Iran was in some ways a break on Iran's modernization. Uh, there, were, there were several plans throughout the 20th century to try to modernize Iran and uh, uh, really and use oil revenues to do that modernization. And none of them really worked. 
So Iran today is still a country like Venezuela. In some ways, it's very dependent upon oil, very dependent upon those revenues. So where did this start and when did it start? It started in 1912 when oil was discovered in Iran and an oil company was established in Iran. It was then called Persia. And uh, the Iranians, the Persians, as they were called then, did not own this oil. Okay, that the discovery was made by a person named uh, 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 Sir Darcy. And uh, we actually have a picture of him if you want to pull up uh, uh, image one. There he is. So this is the guy who actually made uh, the discovery of oil in Iran and he helped to set up a company called Anglo Persian. And this company, even though the oil was in Iran, uh, the, the company was not in Iran. The company was actually uh, founded in Great Britain and it was actually owned a uh, majority by the British government. And they decided, uh, the British government decided uh, right before World War I to uh, go off of oil, but to use, pardon me, to go off of coal, but to use oil in their naval fleet. And they decided this because with Anglo-Persian, this new oil company, they actually had access to oil. So, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the, the Iranians had oil and yet they didn't have oil because uh, the British actually controlled oil there. Now, uh, in this early period, the British paid royalties to the Iranians by terms of an agreement, a royalty agreement. Uh, but the, the amount of money that the British were making off of this oil was much greater than the revenues they paid. In fact, uh, I think in 1948, uh, the, the sum of the revenues of the Anglo-Persian oil was greater, uh, uh, sorry, the, the taxes that Anglo-Persian paid to the British government was greater than the revenues they paid to Iran. Uh, so there was this enormous uh, amount of wealth that was being sucked out of Iran by the British. And that's the other Sounds part like of the story. Sounds like exploitation to me, John. Well, it's, I mean, it was a part of British imperialism, quite frankly. Yes. Uh, and that's the other part of the story is, that we don't hear much about. It's the British. The Iranian animus against the British in the 20th century is very deep. It's much deeper than their animus against the United States. So. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so we, so the the company was set up. It became a going concern. The British made a lot of money off of this company. The Iranians started fighting back in the 1930s. They complained to the British government. They said, "Look, this, this, these revenues are not enough." And so the British had to step back and and sign an agreement that gave the Iranians more revenues. Uh, and then after World War II, uh, the British government, understanding now that it was no longer the biggest kind of the biggest stick around that the United States and the American oil companies were the biggest stick around. Uh, the, the British uh, uh, negotiated agreement by which the United States actually got a share in the oil of Iran, got a piece, it became a consortium between Anglo-Persian and, and uh, American oil companies. Well, why so, did the American oil companies have the leverage to require that? Well, they, they, simply because they were by this time the largest oil companies in the world, the most mm -hmm. profitable and the largest in the world. Mm -hmm. And the British felt that they didn't want to get left behind by these mm -hmm. companies. Mm -hmm. So it was the British decision. It wasn't an American decision, but uh, the British decided, hey, we're, we're going we're gonna to sign this. We're going to allow the Americans into the Iranian market because there's safety in that, because the Iranians just couldn't just you know couldn't just target uh, uh, you know the British on this they'd have to look at other other entities that were involved so so this agreement goes into effect I believe it is 1948 and soon after Iran catches what I'll call the the oil nationalism bug now this is a bug that uh, the Mexican government had caught early in the 20th century. It's a bug that the Venezuelan uh, government was catching in the 1940s and 50s. But the Iranians are quite early to uh, this, this idea that the resource uh, in their country and under their soil actually belongs to them. I know that sounds funny, to, right? Today, we, okay, of course it belongs to Iran. It's Iranian oil, but back then, uh, you actually had to assert sovereign rights over oil, and uh, eventually uh, the, 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 uh, the oil companies actually recognize 
uh, this part of it. This is not such a big problem. Uh, it sounds this like it idea was the that, end of oil imperialism. You know, you have imperialism for land, I suppose, for control over yeah. the country. And yeah. then you move to resources like oil, and you retain that for as long as you can. Yep. There's lots of money in it. And then finally, yep. the, the country realizes that you're just doing, you know, resource imperialism, and they and they have to take charge of their own resources. That's And that's what and, happened all over the world, including Africa, too, right? That's right. So this is, I would say this is the beginning of the end. Iran is, uh, after Mexico, is the second country in the world to declare uh, to what we call is na to nationalize their oil. And they did this in 1948. Then in 1951, they elect a new prime minister, a guy named uh, Mohammed Mossadegh. Now, Mossadegh is an oil nationalist. So it was no surprise that he was elected. Uh, but most, and most, so Mossadegh is a very, he's, pop, you know, he's elected president, he's a popular guy, and uh, uh, he's also making Westerners angry because as part of this oil nationalization, the Iranian government actually takes over uh, the oil facilities at the Abadan oil refinery. And they're, and they're planning to take over the other facilities at these, you know, these other, you know, the pumping stations and the refineries. So, uh, so the when British you say take respond over, very. You mean appropriate, take over by yes, force. Yes. Oh, okay. And, and invite the British uh, staff members, the you know British oil workers, out of the country. It's like <laughs> okay, it. you're done, and we're in. So this was yeah, this was the the concrete nationalization of of uh, Iranian oil, mm -hmm. and this made the British, not the Americans, but the British, very angry. And so the British decide to, uh, first of all, they, they put an embargo on Iranian oil. They send warships to the Persian Gulf and they actually refuse to, uh, you know, they don't allow Iranian oil to leave port. Uh, and the other thing that, what, that happens is the British are thinking about going to war against Iran to take care of this issue. Uh, the Americans say no, so that ultimately the British do not. Uh, but the other thing that's going on here, so you have oil nationalists. And this, is, this pits the British against the Iranians. Uh, but you also have the Cold War going on. Cold War is brand new. The Soviet Union actually occupied northern Iran during World War II. And only in 1946 had they withdrawn from northern Iran and Azerbaijan. So, uh, so the Iranians, uh, I mean, which way are they going to you know, twist? Which way are they going to go? Are they going to go towards the Soviets? Are they going to with the West and with uh, Great Britain and the United States. So the British are also very concerned about losing, potentially losing Iran. So that's, that's another reason why the British react very strongly and threaten war against Iran in, in uh, 1951. And, and then this crisis between Great Britain and, and Iran spreads. It spreads to the United States. And then in 1952, you have the election of a new president. Uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower in the United States, and Eisenhower is going to be tough, a, a tougher guy on this kind of thing. He's going to draw the line against the Soviets. And so Eisenhower sends his man to Iran, it's actually an operative of the CIA. His name is Kermit Roosevelt, and he is, in fact, the grandson of Teddy Roosevelt, one of our presidents. If we could bring a picture of, of Kermit Roosevelt up, just that. Yeah, there's Kermit. So Kermit spent some time in uh, the Middle East. You can see there by his outfit, you know, he was all decked out for the Middle East. But he was at that point in 1952 and then in the 1953, he was actually working for the CIA as an operative in the Middle East. One of his main uh, kind of uh, areas of responsibility was Iran. And so Kermit Roosevelt enters Iran and he brings these big satchels with him. And the question is, what was in the satchels? Jay, any ideas? No, but it's a cliffhanger, John. And because it's a cliffhanger, <laughs> we're going to take a short break. So everybody okay. watching will wonder and wait and come back ah, to us one minute from idea. now and find out okay. what was in Kermit's satchels. John David right. and history okay. professor. Wow, what a story. We'll be right back. <laughs> Hi guys, I'm your host Lillian Kumik from Lillian's Vegan World and I come to you live every second Friday from 3pm 
And this is the show where I talk about the plant-based lifestyle and veganism. So we go through recipes, some upcoming events, uh, information about health, regarding your health, and uh, just some ideas on how you can have a better lifestyle, eat healthier, and have fun at the same time. So do join me. I look forward to seeing you, and uh, aloha. Aloha, y'all. My name is Mitch Ewan. I'm from the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, and I'm the host of Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy. We're on every Wednesday at 4 o'clock, and we hope that we have interesting uh, guests who talk to us about various energy things that are happening in Hawaii, all the way from PV to windmills to hydrogen, close to my heart, electric buses and electric vehicles. So please dial in every Wednesday at 4 o'clock on Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live with John David and I couldn't wait to get back because I wanted to find out what <laughs> was in Kermit's satchels. <laughs> right. It's Jay, it's it's that currency of currencies. There were bags of money oh, okay. in the satchels. And why was Kermit Roosevelt, the CIA operative, carrying bags of money into Iran? Well, there was a plan. The plan was called Operation Ajax, and uh, the plan was to destabilize the government of Mossadegh. How nice. And then get him out and replace him with somebody they were more amenable to, like the Shah, the Shah of Iran, who had been deposed from Iran and was living abroad. So Kermit uses the money in the satchel to pay people off on the street. To, essentially, it's, these are people are are protesters, and they could care less about politics, but they're being paid to engage in protesters against the government of Mossadegh. So if we could bring up, there's another image here. Uh, can We can bring up the protest image. Uh, okay, that's Mossadegh, then that's a good one because there he is, and Mossadegh's a very interesting character because he's a guy who's, uh, uh, he's a very emotional guy. He's, you can see there he's a, giving a passionate speech to his citizens. Um, He's also a very kind of uh, flighty guy. He's, uh, uh, when things get really rough, Mossadegh goes to bed. Uh -huh. So, uh, and hopes that things, you know, the rough times will pass. So, but if you can bring up the other slide, this is, the next slide is a slide. This is a protest slide. And this is actually anti-Mossadegh protesters who have more than likely, you see it, you look in that crowd, those people have more than likely been paid off by Kermit Roosevelt that participate in this Rose, in this protest. Uh, and this is how the government of Mossadegh falls. This is so the, the interesting, The military John. joins so in the protest. You know, we've been thinking that the United States is pure as the driven snow. Um, yeah, right, would never right. pay protesters. It would never pay to bring a regime <laughs> down this way. Okay, <clears throat> Jay, now you're being <clears throat> funny, that's, Jay. That's Putin. That's Putin doing yeah, it. Yeah, but you're, now you're... Now you're now you're being funny. Okay, I you know I I sorry I can't take this seriously, right? <laughs> so the problem is the United States has has done this. It, we yeah, still do it. So, okay. yeah. so yeah, so uh, so we deposed Mossadegh. We brought the Shah back in, uh, the Shah of Iran, whose whose father really founded the monarchy. Uh, honestly, it's it's not much of a monarchy at all. It's uh, it's actually uh, I mean his father founded the monarchy in the 1920s, it's kind of made up. And, uh, uh, and so uh, there's not much legitimacy behind it. It's just convenient for the Americans because now they need a leader. They've deposed the other leader. So you bring back the Shah. Okay, so this, the Shah becomes a ruler. He's very authoritarian. I mean, Iran does actually not have a democracy at this point. They've lost their democracy mm -hmm. uh, to the Shah. And, uh, He's, he's somebody who is, uh, uh, he, he's, uh, you know, he, he jails dissenters, uh, uh, he cavorts with other dictators, um, but he does have a very strong alliance in the United States. And so the Shah, and, and he's immensely unpopular in Iran. As, as, as we talked about before the show, you know, Iran is this country that has a, a growing middle class in the 1960s and the 1970s. They have some prosperity with the oil. They have a good university system. And so Iran is on more of a path to westernization than maybe any other country in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Now they do have this issue of the mullahs. 
the uh, conservative religious elites who have uh, at times in the history of Persia have actually run things. So there's always been this tension between the secular rule and the, and the religious rule. But so uh, uh, the Shah actually puts down the, the mullahs and they, they have no power under him. And he's, I mean, he tortures them and he makes them actually into very popular people because we're talking about the religion, the Islamic religious leaders. He makes them very popular because they're put upon, they're, 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 you know, they're persecuted by, uh, by the Shah. And so in 1979, uh, the Shah reaches the end of the line and a rebellion breaks out. And of course, this is the 1979 Islamic rebellion that takes place in Iran, which ends in the shaping of this uh, Iranian state, which is a mixed democracy and theocracy. Now, Americans, you know, most Americans, I think, don't understand that Iran is still an active democracy today. Uh, it's with hard, it's well hard to understand that. It's hard to understand it that, is. You know, democracy, which is also a theocracy. I, you know, I mean, right, we, we, but, we were taught over our lifetime that two, two are essentially inconsistent when you have right, religion. That's true. You know, that's true that state. we were taught that, but, but it works in the Iranian case. It actually appeases the mullahs, and then they can run private lives, private behavior, and then the the everyday running of the government actually happens through the parliament, through departments, and through the president's office and the prime minister's office. Mm -hmm. So Iran does, in fact, have a functioning democracy. Uh, now it's complicated because of the because of the the uh, the ayatollah and the the mullahs and the you know the the military that's grown up uh, on the the religious side of the government. So uh, the the uh, the the, the so-called Iranian guards, right? You know, so this. So this, was this was this, this a bloody a bloody experience? This transition where the Shah, the Shah was thrown out, uh, and I suppose because by and large it was US. not. No, it was a popular rebellion. Um, so no, there was not an intense civil war that took place afterwards. What happens is, uh, uh, wealthy Iranians who have means they immigrate. Yeah, they go outside the country. So you see this Im uh, intense immigration to Scandinavia, and to the United States, to other parts of Europe. So, so that's one of the things that happens is the opponents of the, of the Ayatollah, and they actually leave the country, and that's mm. too bad. But mm. um, so, so the situation between the United States and Iran, that tension then, because they had been allies in the 1970s. I mean, Jimmy Carter, president of the United States, actually – attends a big celebration that the Shah holds in, I believe it's in 1977 or 78, out in the middle of the desert, cel celebrating the thousand year anniversary of, of the kingdom of Persia. And, and Carter attends that. And so the Shah has got this kind of outward legitimacy, but he has no legitimacy with his people. So when the rebellion takes place, uh, the American reputation in in uh, in uh, Iran also it disappears like the Shah. You have and a so picture was, of Jimmy Carter, don't you? One of your yeah, slides. I do actually. So during so what? Okay, this is a picture of Jimmy Carter and uh, L. Bruce Langan, who by the way is actually born and raised in my hometown of right near my hometown of Butterfield, Minnesota. Uh, Langan was the charge to fair. Uh, in Iran, when the hostage crisis occurred, when the hostages were taken, he actually was the leader of the hostages and tried to, you know, keep them, keep morale up. And it did a great job. And uh, I claim some credit because he was from my hometown. Okay, I can't claim any credit. But, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but he, in fact, was from my hometown uh, in, in southern Minnesota. So there he is with Jimmy Carter after the hostages have been released. And, I see. Uh, and but so, in fact, so the hostages a, were not released until right after the inauguration of Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Well, no, they were they were actually released. Uh, actually, I'm not sure about the timing of that, but that picture would indicate that. I mean, Jimmy Carter. Why is he meeting with them if he's no longer in office? So, yes. Yes. Uh, I th I think they were in fact released right before Reagan took office uh -huh. uh, with a deal that was negotiated by the Re the incoming Reagan administration. I see. So. Okay. Um, so, uh, so, so you have this Islamic rebellion and it means that the United States is no, gonna, no longer going to have influence in Iran. So, so this is a big problem for the United States. Uh, and, uh, you know, the oil continues, the oil continues to be an important issue, but 
So you have Operation Ajax in which, you know, in 1953, in which uh, a duly elected president of Iran was deposed by the United States. That's very clear. Uh, there's no, you know, second guessing or, you know, saying, oh, that's not true. That's absolute historical fact. And then, and, and so this turns many Iranians against the United States. And then you have this Islamic rebellion that takes place and you have the hostage situation and, oh, this exacerbates bad feelings between the United States and Iran. And so and this if turns the want... United States, the people in the street in the United States against Iran. All of a sudden, exactly. you know, it was very clear to everybody that they must be a rogue nation. We, they were no longer our friend. Uh, right. And that, right. that has uh, yeah. had a big shadow from then till now. We only have a minute left, John, and I wonder if right. you, you said you were going to talk about other, other uh, you know, elements of the history between the U.S. and Iran. Could you give us a, a precis on what's going to do next time in the next show? Yeah, so I, actually, I think in the next show, I might invite a, a friend in who, who, is a, who is a real expert on Iran, on that region, and uh, we'll, we'll dig more into depth on, uh, uh, the, for instance, the Iran-Iraq war, what was the U.S. role in this, uh, the uh, the uh, Iran Contra uh, incident affair in the Reagan uh, presidency, where uh, uh, the actual so where the United States actually attempted to sell arms to Iran, their supposed you know uh, the supposed devil, the evil empire, and then of course uh, the the time period after the 9/11 attacks, when the Bush administration had identified or labeled Iran, Syria. And North Korea as uh, oh, the, the the new axis of evil. There's miles to go. There's miles to go before we right, reach right. current so times. And we so need to understand there's a lot, this. There's a lot more to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Iran yeah, so. is an important country in the Middle East. It it's has still been important it's a with the it's United a major States. oil producer in the Middle East, and it's it's a place that still has the potential to be a stabilizer in the Middle East. Ah, uh, from your lips to God's ears. About. Yeah. Okay, yes, John yes. David and okay, HPU history professor, my favorite history right. professor. Uh, so oh, we'll be there back you go, next Jay. time. Now you're Th talking. Thank you so much, John. Bye -bye. All right, take care, Jay. Bye bye.